Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second installment uh, in Reed Smith Labor and Employment Group's uh, new video chat series, Employment Law Watch Real Time. Uh, my name is Mark Goldstein. I'm a partner in our New York office, uh, and I'm joined today by Amanda Brown and John McDonald in our Dallas and Princeton offices, respectively. As we did with the first chat in the series, we're going to be talking about the emergency temporary standard that was recently issued by the federal government agency OSHA. Essentially, this standard, uh, once it takes effect, and if it takes effect, which we'll talk about shortly, will require that all private employers in the U.S. with 100 or more employees implement either a mandatory vaccination policy or a policy that allows employees to choose between becoming fully vaccinated and submitting to weekly COVID testing. There are a whole host of questions surrounding uh, the ETS, certainly more than we could answer in the initial chat series from that was released last week, and more than we could address today. Today, what we're really gonna focus on, however, is the legal challenges that have arisen with respect to the ETS. And particularly given the uh, impending deadline, uh, the first one for which is December 5th, associated with the ETS, the legal challenges and how they may play out are, are incredibly important. I will be the first to admit that we don't know how this is going to play out. And I think John and Amanda would agree with me that var the courts at issue could go a few different ways. Uh, but we're gonna talk about some of the ways that that could happen. Um, and also some of the developments that we've already seen thus far um, in, in one particular circuit. Uh, so by way of that background, um, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is one of the uh, federal courts of appeals, has issued, uh, issued a stay of the ETS. And I'm going to turn it over to Amanda in a second to talk about that. Um, but yesterday, importantly, the, uh, the government held a multi-state, multi-circuit lottery, which essentially um, at random picked a federal circuit court to hear all of the litigations that have been brought about the ETS. They're going to consolidate those litigations, and one circuit court is going to uh, hear those litigations. The Sixth Circuit is the one that ended up receiving uh, the litigation um, even though the Fifth Circuit had previously issued the stay. So I'm going to turn it over. Amanda, can you tell us a little bit about the Fifth Circuit stay, how they were able to issue a stay uh, before this lottery process took place, and what it may mean going forward, and, and, and also kind of what the Fifth Circuit said? Sure. Thanks, Mark, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in for our video chat today. I'm Amanda Brown. I'm a senior associate in the Dallas office. And like uh, Mark mentioned, there was a stay of the OSHA ETS. Um, it was issued really quickly after we got the ETS. We heard Thursday the 4th that the ETS was forthcoming and had the text. It was published on Friday the 5th. And then by Saturday the 6th, the Fifth Circuit had already stayed the ETS. So when you ask Mark, how did they do it? They did it because they did it fast. <laughs> they were literally the first challenge to the ETS and they did it incredibly fast. Um, so as you may know, um, OSHA's ETS um, is issued pursuant to the authority that OSHA has to protect um, employees from a grave danger in the workplace. And essentially what um, the Fifth Circuit said, and it's a stay of the ETS, was that OSHA had not established that COVID constitutes a grave danger to the workplace. Um, there were a lot of different arguments in there. It's a pretty lengthy opinion, but some of them included that the ETS did not distinguish among workplaces in different regions with different levels of transmission. So regardless if you're in an area with very high transmission rates of COVID or an area with very low transmission rates, you'd be subject to the same standard under the OSHA ETS. Um, and they also took issue with the time that it took OSHA to issue the ETS, right? COVID has been going on now since March, 2020. Um, and just in November, 2021, we got this ETS. Um, and they also took issue, you know, pointing out the fact that um, OSHA has delayed, you know, not only implementing the ETS, but now the, the enforcement dates, which Mark alluded to earlier, are, have been pushed out with the federal contractor EO to align with the OSHA ETS. And so the court said, how can it be this grave danger? When the, when the administration is actually pushing out the dates to comply. Um, there's certainly a lot to get into with the Fifth Circuit stay, but I think you know what's important, as Mark noted, is that it's not the final word by any stretch of the imagination with what's gonna happen with this ETS. It's got um, several potential options that could happen with enforcement. Um, but for right now, it is stayed under the Fifth Circuit's ruling. Um, OSHA posted on its website just yesterday on November 16th that it has stopped any actions that it's been taking to implement the ETS. 
And I believe yesterday also Calosha, which is a state plan, um, also announced that they were stopping their, their activities to prepare a state plan under the OSHA ETS because of the Fifth Circuit's ruling. So uh, we've gotten a lot of questions about what that means for you employers, and we'll get into that uh, shortly. So Mark, I'll kick it back to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and, and as we noted earlier, the case, the consolidated cases now, there were, there were lawsuits uh, challenging the, the ETS filed in each one of the 11 circuit courts. As I mentioned, the random lottery that was conducted yesterday has now assigned the case to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, which covers Kentucky, Michigan, Ohio, and Tennessee. Um, and uh, perhaps notably, 11 Republican judges or 11 Republican appointed judges are on the Sixth Circuit. Five uh, of the 16 judges were appointed by Democratic presidents. Um, so the case now goes to the Sixth Circuit. John, what are some of the um, ways that the Sixth Circuit could uh, resolve or handle the case? And potentially, could it uh, go up even further to the U.S. Supreme Court? Thanks, Mark. Uh, appreciate that. Um, but we're all kind of looking at what's going on here. But now that it's with the Sixth Circuit, and as Mark indicated, uh, where that circuit covers, that's going to be the Circuit Court of Appeals that makes the decision on what to do. And it has some options. It could extend the stay and allow underlying litigation as to whether or not the ETS um, should be enforced and is a proper use of the OSHA's power to continue. It could lift the stay and allow the ETS to go into effect while that underlying litigation continues as well. Um, and as Mark just alluded to, no matter what it does, our full expectation is that one either party will be taking this up to the Supreme Court and ask the Supreme Court to take a look at this uh, and see if the Supreme Court will do so prior to allowing all the litigation uh, to work out underneath it, which is not a sure thing. So we could see any number of things happening here, but for purposes of employers, the difficulty is now it puts calls into question or puts into question, what do you do? You have this ETS, you have some effective dates coming uh, down the pike, you have to decide how you're gonna comply with. There's a lot of obligations for employers, um, which I'm sure we'll get into, um, but right now, all, you, all we know for certain is that the Fifth Circuit has stated that OSHA has said it's not going to move forward with it at the time, at currently, while the litigation is pending, that the Sixth Circuit is now going to essentially re-review what the Fifth Circuit did and decide whether to maintain the stay, lift the stay, or lift the stay, and ultimately decide um, whether the OSHA, in issuing the ETS, properly used its power. A quick history on ETSs, um, just for purposes of some background, um, you know, OSHA's done it maybe 10 times. Uh, I believe six of those times the ETS was challenged in courts. Only one of those times that the ETS issued by OSHA actually survived judicial review. Uh, so the history is not in the uh, favor of the ETS surviving, although given the state of where we are with this pandemic, with the unique situation we're dealing with, I think it's, it's tough to lay too much stock into that historical analysis of where ETSs have gone in the past. Mark? Thanks, John. And initially, the Sixth Circuit, uh, the, the, the case that will be heard before the Sixth Circuit, there will be three of the appellate judges hearing the case. Um, after those three appellate judges uh, make a decision, ultimately, however the litigation goes, and, and before the case potentially goes to the Supreme Court, is there another step in between where all 16 judges of the Sixth Circuit could potentially hear the case? Yes, Mark, um, to get into the procedural nitty gritty, so to speak. Um, so that's right. The first thing that'll happen is this a three panel, three of the judges will be in panel to make a decision. After those three judges make a decision, the parties can seek to have that decision reheard by the entire 16 judges on the, on the Sixth Circuit. Um, in, in essence, asking the, for a ruling en banc. Uh, some people pronounce that differently, but it essentially just means that all the judges will weigh in um, and then uh, we'll have a determination by the Sixth Circuit en banc, and then it can go to the Supreme Court thereafter. So there are a couple of procedural uh, you know, issues that can go between the three judge issuance and the Supreme Court. Awesome. Thanks, John. Now, Amanda, we've talked uh, a bit about, and you certainly mentioned it, the fact that the effective dates or, or certain deadlines associated with the ETS are soon coming up, which could run into some conflict uh, with the ongoing litigation. I know that the first uh, deadline that's coming up is December 5th, and, and then the one after that is December 4th. Can you give us a high-level 
uh, you know, summary of what those two deadlines um, kind of are and, and, and in your view, how the litigation developments to date might impact those deadlines? Yeah, sure, Mark. So um, the first deadline, like you mentioned, by December 5th or really starting on December 6th, um, employers have to have the, the majority of all the requirements under the ETS in place. And so that's your policies um, stating whether you're going to require vaccination for all employees or whether you're going to allow um, vaccination or testing as your policy. Um, that's a survey of all your covered workers to determine their vaccination status. Um, that's communicating all of the information that you're required to communicate under the ETS to your employees, um, which really constitutes training of your employees on the ETS. Um, that also includes uh, making sure you have the paid time or vaccination support as it's styled in the ETS um, in place. And, you know, I think it's really important to if you take a step back as an employer to understand what all that entails, right? So if you're an employer who's going to be allowing a testing option, you need to have in place, even before January 4th, which is the next deadline, um, you need to have in place your tests, right? And we all know how hard that is right now for employers to get those tests. So you have a lot of a lot of runway leading up to this December 5th or 6th deadline. And then by January 4th, that's when you have to have testing and all the vaccination in place. Um, under your policy. So by January 4th, your employees are going to have to be tested weekly or every seven days if they're coming into the work site um, or they have to be vaccinated. Um, but it's really important to think about all the planning that goes into it, right? Are you going to create a new PTO code that goes for your um, leave obligations under the ETS? How are you going to be sourcing your tests? How are you going to be providing for reimbursement of those tests? There's just a lot of logistical um, things that employers need to consider um, leading up to those December 5th and January 4th deadlines. So while um, you know we all love to think that we could put off planning for those deadlines with the stay, um, given the uncertainty and given the large amount of planning that employers have to do, um, it certainly makes sense to, to move forward with your planning purposes um, while this stay is in place. Thanks, Amanda. And, and John, you know, there are employees are certainly in the news reading about, um, you know, the ETS and, and the various developments. And, um, you know, they may not understand how the multi circuit lottery process works. They may have simply seen that a, a federal appeals court basically said that the ETS is on hold for now. So if you're an employer communicating with your employees about the ETS, assuming you're a private U.S. employer with 100 or more employees, uh, what kind of communications, if any, are you sending out? Well, I think you have to be a little careful right now, right, because it's, um, it's unsure whether this is even to go into effect. But uh, as Amanda just went through, this is not a small undertaking for employers with 100 or more employees, and that's not a great number of employees. So we have a lot of companies that we might consider to be medium-sized businesses who are going to have a fairly large undertaking to go into uh, to deal with and put in place, and their employees are certainly going to be asking questions about what's going to happen. So what, what we've seen amongst our clients, what we've been recommending so far is, look, it's going to require a lot of planning. You know, be general in, in what you explain to the employees, but let them know that this is in place, that you are taking steps necessary to comply with the ETS should it should the stay be lifted, and that that's gonna that you're gonna have information for the employees, which is what you're gonna be required to do as an employer anyway. So you can let them know that information is coming, that policies will be implemented, provided that the court that after the ETS runs its uh, course through the courts. Um, and just let them know that they're going to have an, a heads up and kind of an advanced uh, explanation via policy materials as well as communications to the employees that will explain you know what they do and do not have to do um and in the, in the background the employer are going to have to decide you know uh, what they're going to do with regard to the selections that they're going to make in terms of whether they're going to offer the test out option or just have a mandatory vaccine policy go through all the logistical preparation that Amanda just referenced. Um, and, you know, obviously going to work on the community, you're going to have to work on the communications and kind of have them ready to fire off pretty quickly in terms of an initial generic, you know, general explanation of where we're headed. And then the more fine tuned and detailed uh, informational requirements that the ETS itself dictates employers must provide to their employees uh, by currently December 5th, if the stay is lifted, um, that's when the, the, the first uh, slew of information and policies have to be issued. So employers can't really wait 
uh, until it runs its way through the courts. Great, thank you both uh, for joining me today. This has been our second uh, episode in our new video chat series, Employment Law Watch Real Time. Thank you all for joining us uh, and for watching. Uh, this is not the final word on the OSHA ETS. And uh, you'll definitely see all of our faces soon again uh, and other of our colleagues talking about further developments and further issues surrounding the ETS and other legal developments uh, in the employment law space across the country. So for Amanda and for John, thank you very much for joining us and have a great day.